Welcome to a new episode of Superpowered Fancast. This is Darren. I have a fantastic show for everyone today and I'm, that I'm excited about. On this episode, I have the privilege of interviewing actor and writer David Desmalchian. Now, Desmalchian is known for characters like Kurt in the Ant-Man films and most recently, Veb in Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania opposite Paul Rudd. He also played Peter DeVries in Denise uh, Villeneuve's, and I don't, I don't know, I'm probably saying that wrong, um, Dune adaptation. He also played Polka Dot Man in The Suicide Squad for James Gunn. And most recently, Late Night with the Devil and the recently released Boston Strangler opposite Kira Knightley and Carrie Coon uh, playing Albert DeSalvo. He can next be seen in The Boogeyman based on the short story by Stephen King and Oppenheimer from director Christopher Nolan. Desmaltine is also the writer and co-creator of the Doc Dark Horse comic series, Count Crowley, which is coming out soon with its third arc. Now, Count Crowley is the story of aspiring reporter Jerry Bartman, whose personal demons get her busted down to hosting a late-night creature feature series at her small-town TV station. Now, as she battles her own demons, she finds herself battling real-life ones as well. Now, we're going to talk about uh, David's career, uh, his acting career, his own personal battles, as well as talking more about Count Crowley. So without further ado, here's my interview with David Desmaltian. There he is. There he is. Hey, how are you? Oh, man. I'm so happy to see you. You have uh, you have been such an amazing uh, voice in my journey with Count Crowley and the fact that you have always just followed it so like closely and seemed to be so invested in it has been like such a joy for me, man. I love it. I love Superpower Fan Cast. So thank you. Well, I I I, I appreciate it uh, definitely. I'm a huge fan of yours, and I I love Count Crowley because it it's it literally speaks to everything that I grew up with, like Svengoolie and Elvira, uh, Joe Bob Briggs, all of those. Yep. All those. Yes. Like, you know, yes. Well, that's what I wanted. You know, I wanted to go into that space and I wanted to play with all that stuff, but I wanted to do it in a way that felt fresh and exciting and dangerous. And I wanted to talk about the things that really matter to me as we're living in this crazy time in history and as we're, you know, trying to figure out how to talk about things like addiction and mental illness through a new lens. Uh, we've got to stop the stigmas and the monsters, you know, of the world sometimes are almost less scary than the monsters we have to face within ourselves. So, all of that, but through that, you know, hammer, horror, universal monsters, uh, RKO pictures, William Castle lens, and, you know, all the old classic uh, horror of yesteryear that we love so much. Like, I wanted, I wanted all that and more, uh, you know, on these pages. And uh, here we are. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. Like, I... Again, like my, I grew up with, with horror films. Like my, my stepdad would, you know, we would just sit down and watch everything from like, I mean, especially things I probably was too young for like everything. Me too. Me too. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Everything from like reanimator to evil dead to old, uh, uh, classic universal, uh, monster movies. So, I mean, I I'm sure you probably, uh, answered this question before, but I've kind of always wanted to, to know, like, um, beyond just the hosts themselves like what kind of made you decide that you wanted to create a character like jerry and 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 do a series like count crowley so i grew up in kansas city mm -hmm. in a very conservative very um you know th that reality of the 1980s reagan america where monsters were all the others you know, all the people that looked differently and spoke differently and all the people who were queer, all that stuff was like, it was so interesting. I lived in this very evangelical Kansas community um, and it, none of it ever set right with me. I always felt like I didn't, something was off, something was wrong, something was strange about the way that we were operating and I would tiptoe downstairs and sneak because it was against the rules and watch um, my first 
crush and hero cremation mortem on the creature feature who introduced me to Lon Chaney and Boris Karloff and Peter Lorre and, you know, Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee and Vincent Price and so many other people. And I just, I was enraptured with it. And I was enraptured with the power and the magic and the transportative qualities of comic books and the modern mythology of superheroes. And so this idea, you know, that, it would be really cool if there was somebody who was like a cremation mortem or then when I got to Chicago, started studying theater and I fell in love with this good friend of mine, Sven Gulli or Chicago, yeah, we were born love, love, love. As soon as I got to Chicago, then it was, he used to be on the afternoons and the weekends and then he moved around, but I was always tracking Sven Gulli down and then getting into the history and, and Joe Bob, I'd grown up watching on up all night and I used to watch, um, I used, to, I used to love reading about like Vampira and all that mm -hmm. stuff. So I just thought, man, how cool would it be if there's like a, a host of a creature feature who's also, that's like their, that's like their um, alter ego, you know, that's just the, their cover, but they're fighting monsters. Right. And then, you know, re life happens. And I start this journey of being an actor and I nearly lose my life with my battles with addiction, drugs, alcohol, depression. Uh, mental illness, I start to lose my my connection to this world and I nearly completely left this world at one point and then thankfully through recovery and community and the power and magic of science and, and, and recovery, I was able to get back to living my life and was able to start collecting comics again and work at a job and pay my rent and then by a miracle was able to get back into acting and through acting, just my love of telling stories grew and grew and I practiced the art of writing and continued to train as a writer and more opportunities presented themselves. And I thought this hero that I always wanted to write a story about, this hero that I always wanted to create, what if he was a she who wanted to be a reporter, something terrible happens to her, no one believes her, which makes her feel crazy. She goes into the depths of alcoholism because I understand that monster and she gets this job as a you know horror host and turns out the person that she replaced wasn't just a horror host was actually fighting monsters and I, and and it all just started to click for me you know and and the universe really conspired on my behalf as all of these pieces fell in place and and suddenly i'm you know pitching this idea to dark horse you know one of the great comic publishers especially in the horror space and like you know here we are all these years later and it's like we're going into volume three now you know it's crazy right i was gonna say because the, the, there's such a great progression of jerry's story from from volume to volume so i, I, and I don't want to uh i want to ask questions but i don't want to i don't want to spoil it for myself frankly <laughs> it's just kind of see well where... i'll try and be cautious i won't give anything too much away but i but i i, I love your questions because i know you gen genuinely are someone who has seemed to over the years really get what it is that I'm trying to do. Right. And although we've only really communicated through, you know, the the internet, I feel like I like you you have a vested interest in Jerry's fate. And that makes me excited as a writer because I know that people who care passion, when people come to signings or when people send me you know, their, their fan art of Count Crowley or when I see cosplayers and they, they post about it and I see the way people talk about her, it makes me, it's one of the greatest feelings of gratitude I have as a writer because I wanted it to not just look cool. I wanted not just to have kick-ass battles and awesome, you know, sequences of horror and action, but I wanted there to be a character that people could really care about and worry about. And because if you start really getting into the comic, you'll realize that nobody is safe. Anybody could be up for grabs, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And again, that's, that's going back into the, the progression of her as a character is that it would be easy to kind of keep her as, you know, one dimensional where she's just, you know, well, yeah, she's fighting monsters, but she's also battling her alcohol alcoholism. But she progresses in so many different ways, both uh, interpersonally and with her addiction to the point where she's trying to help others with theirs, but she's still dealing with her own demons. So uh, that's what I kind of want to 
I, I want to know if that I want to. I'm sure that progression is going to still going to keep happening, but I kind of want to know a little bit about the next arc of her character, like how because things are getting so things are getting bigger for her now. Like it's not yes. it, it's spreading beyond just her just her her hometown and and her own individual struggles. Like things are getting bigger and they're getting more complicated, and she's and it, it's going to be hard for her to kind of keep you know having that that dual life of yeah I'm I'm a horror host but yeah but I'm also actually fighting real monsters and just having like no one believe her like just the fact like her relationship I like I want to know like does her relationship with her brother progress in 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 kind of that way as well like does he get kind of brought into it you'll what who's going to find out and who needs to be kept in the dark is something that i will leave for you to discover as you're reading but i will say that jerry will learn in a very painful way that when people who are not appointed and it turns out she is damn well appointed i mean she doesn't fall under the hypnosis of a vampire she has uncanny battle abilities when it comes to fighting monsters there's all these things about her that say you're appointed. This is your fate. Even though Vincent Frights and others believe that a woman cannot be appointed. The truth is she's pretty much clearly appointed by the time we get through volume two. And when people who are not appointed find out the truth of what's going on, two things gen generally happen. One, those people um, meet really terrible ends. And two, Jerry, people don't believe the truth, can't believe the truth, even when the truth is presented in front of them. And and someone saying, you guys, this is real. There are monsters. They're real. You could end up you know, in a padded room. Right. So for me, as somebody who has been on the path of recovery in you know, being clean and sober now for almost 21 years... Each step of the journey in the beginning, it starts, as they say, a day at a time. And then all of a sudden, you're starting to learn and develop the skills for how to go a day without a drink or two days without a drink. And then how to start to you know, face crises without completely falling apart in your life. And slowly, each step, you're another day sober. You're another day closer to your purpose, to your true self. But the challenges get harder right. and the challenges get more complex. And I wanted to incorporate that into Jerry's journey because for me, I caused so much damage when I was deep in my addiction and alcoholism and I broke so much trust and I had so many people who I hurt that I loved that even when I was doing right and doing the best, they couldn't believe me yet. It was going to take a long time. And that's going to be really frustrating for Jerry. Jerry is really striving to do her best at this moment in her journey. And God forbid she gets into a big battle with, let's say, uh, a, a, a spectral being. It whoops her ass. And she ends up showing up late for work. And she's got her clothes torn. Well, her brother's immediately going to be like, you're using again. You're drinking again. That's going to be really tricky. So... But she's going to need allies, and I think you're going to discover as we get into volume three, sometimes, as in real life, the allies that we expected to be there, who we thought were going to be there, aren't. And the people sometimes that we were told are our enemies, the people who we to were told were not to be trusted, the people that we were taught um, are different than us, are actually much more similar to us than we could have ever realized. And so she's going to find allyship in some really crazy places. I hope when you read it, you're going to like drop your comic and be like, no, David did not just do that. That's what <laughs> I hope the reaction I get out of you is. That's what I'm hoping for. Cause again, cause besides uh, Jerry being such an, such an interesting character on her own, she's got a, a really interesting and diverse and uh, complex uh, ca cast of characters around her. So that's, and, and again, that's one of those things that kind of, that that I enjoy because it immerses me in the story. It's not just me just following the main character doing things or the things happening to her, but there's a community of characters that are affected by what she does and that affect how she does the things that she does, that she does herself. So yeah, I'm absolutely looking forward to, to, the, to the new arc, but I, I wanted to ask you because you were talking about uh, studying writing. 
So I kind of wanted to, to to ask you a little bit about like your process is uh, b- because being I would presume being in, in, in both an actor and a writer can be difficult at times. So do you do you write like do you have to have like you know time just carved out and say well I'm at the end of a gig and now I'm gonna now I'm gonna write or is this something where you're not you're in a dressing room or you're waiting in between uh, scenes and things you're just like let me just let me write is it is it a write everywhere or do I need like Stephen King says do I need to to write with the door closed uh, um I my process continues to evolve and mm-hmm. I'm still learning I, I consider myself a student of the craft of of both writing and acting I mean I'm I, I'm always trying to learn and improve but I'm much more green for lack of a better term when it comes to writing I have had much more experience as an actor than as a writer and I've been writing my whole life you know but as far as professionally and like getting things actually out to people sometimes I have to write 10 things to get one thing that's good enough for it to make it to the next stage and so it is a discipline I do it everywhere. I write on airplanes. I write uh, on set often because there's a lot of time as an actor where you're waiting in your trailer to get through the next setup before you can go actually work. The amount of time as an actor that you're actually acting is maybe sometimes 30 to 50% of the day. I'd say about 50% of the day is kind of waiting and, and, and that's the nature of how cinema works. Mm-hmm. So I've always got my notebook and my laptop near me. In fact, right now, as I'm working on new volumes of of Count Crowley, you know, each each project I work on has a different process as well. With Count Crowley, what I tend to do is write like outlines um, and kind of general ideas for myself with maybe some silly storyboardings. And then I actually do page by page breakdowns for my issues. Um, and I then send, then I make sure the outline, you know, is approved by my editor. And then I, um, and then I type um, the, 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 the final outline. I add some imagery of inspiration. And once that's all approved, I go into script writing. I use the final draft um, graphic novel, dark horse style template. Uh, and I am almost done with, volume three issue three right now in fact when i get off with you i probably have one page left to go to put the little cherry on top of that script which is the craziest one i've written yet and um and that's that but each project is different you know i've written screenplays where i dreamt about this idea for years and i sat down and the whole screenplay of 90 pages came out in about a day which was how all creatures here below went for me I spent years writing my film Animals in outline form. Um, Yeah, it just, it always depends on the project. I'm always learning. Just same with acting too. I don't have one approach to how I build characters. I'm always trying different ways in to discovering the voice of the character. Just like I'm always trying to find different ways in to finding the voice of whatever it is that I'm writing. Right. And uh, my next question was going to, was going to be along those lines that I just finished watching uh, Boston Strangler. And yes, I, I watch a lot of like uh, it, uh, a lot of, I, I studied journalism in college. So I pretty much watch any film that has journalism kind of as its base, but I did kind of want to ask, like, how did you there? I mean, Albert DeSalvo has been depicted on screen before. So I kind of, how did you uh, determine how you wanted to portray DeSalvo? Cause the film is so, different in the fact that it doesn't necessarily focus on the murders as much as it focuses on uh, the the investigation into them. Yes. Kind of yes. how did you approach DeSalvo? Which is one of the many things that makes it such an interesting film. And I was excited to be a part of it because, you know, Matt, really gifted director and writer, and then this cast of incredible performers were coming together to tell a story that was not about a man killing women, it's a story about women trying to tell a story right. and how all of the structures and paradigms around power um, and gatekeeping was keeping these women from not only just doing their jobs, but being able to potentially contribute to the saving of lives. Right, right. That is intense. So 
I felt like the way in for me was really getting a handle on and understanding Matt's approach tonally story, which was pretty clear from the beginning. It was going to be grounded, rooted in a, you know, kind of uh, introspective reality. Um, the horror of this film mostly is left in many ways to the imagination. There are shocking moments in the film where you see things that you can't unsee, but many of it is just in description or in the thing that's happening just off of the camera's eye. Right. So I wanted to bring to life a character who felt authentic, who felt, you know, true to the, the real person who was Albert DeSalvo, who did honor to a real human life that also really importantly to me, um, is respectful of the fact that I'm portraying someone who caused so much pain and loss for so many people. Some people are still alive today. You know, he didn't, he murdered a number of women, but he also assaulted dozens, if not hundreds of women. Mm -hmm. And he also, those, those victims have children, grandchildren, nephews, nieces, spouses, partners, siblings, like there's a lot of responsibility in that. So I found as much audio as I could interviews i read letters that he'd written mm -hmm. i read a lot of analysis about him from people who had studied him or been around him it was a dark process man i, w I wish every uh character could be as fun and easy as say veb but uh right. they can't and that's okay i think it's important part of the work you know but I, and i think that's that's great because again i i loved I love the film again from the, an investigative standpoint, but also in the fact that nothing was uh, nothing was glorified. The mur murders weren't glorified. The characters weren't glorified. They there was a it, there was a great intense reality to everything. And I think it's yes. in uh, in your portrayal of DeSalvo is was it, he wasn't some you know in the dark. A boogeyman that was designed lector as yeah yeah i didn't want to be like lector i wanted to i wanted you to meet this guy he's in real life he had this high-pitched childlike voice he was mm -hmm. just kind of you know we he, odd a little yeah. bit charming he was charming enough that he was able to get into so many people's apartments which is so sad you know disarmingly like just confident and like oh that's the thing is that he could be he had the uh the the every the every man quality where you could kind of understand why someone would let him in even if you know he, you know why he's there but you can kind of see how he could disarm someone into letting them into their home so yeah yeah absolutely but also kind of i wanted to to ask you as far as uh like again performance versus versus writing like uh because you've you've been in so many things that that I love, especially because of being a comic book geek. So it's like, are you? Is there? A, uh, I guess I just throw it out there. Have you talked to James Gunn about Polka Dot Man being in the? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I have not. I I feel like when James makes a choice as strong as squashing a character by Starro the Conqueror, it's probably pretty clear that that character has been obliterated into little <laughs> tiny dots of uh, flesh and blood. That being said, um, I hope and I pray that there's a day when I get to be reunited uh, with James on set because working for him was one of the greatest experiences of my life. And Polka Dot Man by far is one of the best characters I've ever had the privilege of bringing to life. Mm -hmm. And James doesn't write any characters that aren't completely fully realized and aren't filled with pathos and heart and comedy and tragedy. He's uh, a master and that's why we're all so lucky that he is getting to lead us into the next chapter of what DC is going to share with us. Right. Uh, I just, just kind of uh, wrapping things up a little bit because you're, uh, you know, I, I spoke about like, I'm a huge Stephen King fan. So the fact that I saw that you're, that you're going to be in the boogeyman, which is one of my favorite short films is I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to that as well, but you're also in uh, a Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer, like, um, and uh, and again, I'm also a horror fan. So, Last Voyage of the Me of the Demeter. So, you, you're in a, a Dracula film. So, kind of how like how uh, I, I guess it's kind of 
you know, banal to ask, like, how excited are you when you about your? Uh, oh, it's a it's a topic. legitimate question. I'm I'm in I'm in actor heaven right now. I'm in Nerdvana and I'm in <laughs> actor heaven. I'm getting to work with some of the best voices in cinema. I'm getting to bring characters to life that are so challenging to me that push me into new depths of my work that stretch me that make force me to have to take risks and i am constantly surrounded by just incredible actors and artists who elevate me every time i'm willing to try and go out on that limb and and take another step forward and i'm so proud of all these projects that are coming out i everything this year from Quantum Mania to Late Night with the Devil to the Boston Strangler to the Boogeyman to Oppenheimer to Last Voyage of the Demeter are all stories that I would love to go and watch and see. So the fact that I get to be a part of them is like, it's this gift. And I don't take a second of it lightly. And going back to Count Crowley, just the battles with addiction and mental illness, I think it's really important for everyone to note out there who feels hopeless or feels like giving up. It's like, Asking for help, learning the power of being able to have the humility to admit when we are needing help from others is one of the things we're not taught early in life, especially as men. Sometimes we're, we're taught that there's a inherent weakness in asking for help. And that makes me really sad because one of the greatest strengths I've been trying to learn and develop is how to lean on others and ask for help when I need it. And I hope that, um, you know, anybody out there who's feeling hopeless or lost or alone will be encouraged to reach out and ask for help because getting to participate in all these amazing movies and getting to write this comic book that's a dream come true and have the life that I have is only possible because of my willingness to ask others for help. Absolutely. And uh, going back to, to Count Crowley, uh, um, as as someone who has fan cast in their, in their name, uh, have you ever thought about um, bringing uh, Cal Crowley to the big screen? And if you Absolutely. And I'm working on it as we speak. I don't know who's going to be the perfect Cal Crowley, but I can tell you that there will be a role for me in that world. Um, and I would love to see maybe Mark Hamill play Vincent Frights. I think he'd be amazing. I could also see Peter Capaldi being a brilliant Vincent Frights. Um, so, yeah. We'll see. <laughs> well, David, thank you so much. No, thank you. I mean it. You're, you're, you've got such a great um, online presence, and I appreciate your passion for genre, and I think you're just a great writer. So thanks for um, thanks for having me on and talking, and I look forward to doing it again. I would absolutely love to. Thank you, you so much. You got it. <laughs> Bye. Bye, buddy. Bye. <laughs> Once again, I want to thank David Desmaltian for being on the fan cast. His new film, Boston Strangler, is currently streaming on Hulu. The Boogeyman will be in theaters June 2nd. Oppenheimer will be in theaters July 21st. And Volumes 1 and 2 of Count Crowley are currently available to purchase. As always, you can find me on Twitter, at SuperpoweredFan. On my website, www.SuperpoweredFanCast.com. Or you can email me at SuperpoweredFanCast at gmail.com. So again, this is Darren uh, for Superpowered Fancast signing off, and thank you for watching.